Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute of History, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwood's Stores, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with our Will Rogers medallion-winning author-historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. It's Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history by the stories we hear. Oklahoma City's Black Friday. John J. Dwyer, what's this story? Well, Gwen, one of the delights of exploring Oklahoma history the way we do in our Oklahomans books, as well as this program, is that we're able to dig into past events that we may know only by name or truly often have no knowledge of whatsoever. Yet to learn about them provides us with a better understanding of who we are how we got to where we are today, our strengths, accomplishments, and heroic deeds, as well as weaknesses and failures that we might learn from them all. In this program and next, we're going to explore a great drama that could have brought disaster down in Oklahoma City, but instead festooned the OKC with honor, justice, and peace. It all happened at the tail end of the momentous decade of the 1960s, and if anyone doubted the pivotal nature of the 60s as a decade for black progress toward full realization of the blessings of American citizenship, the dramatic events of the 1969 Oklahoma City Sanitation Department strike thunderously carried the point. So, a sanitation strike doesn't exactly sound like an electrifying topic of historical conversation, does it? Well, that's why we're going to dive into it. By the summer of 1969, African Americans in Oklahoma had entered into a long procession of newly won, if belatedly won, rights. These included patronizing both private and public businesses, ranging from restaurants to movie theaters to department stores, also hospitals, museums, and integrated public schools, and employment across the gamut of earlier segregated public organizations. Virtually all of this, if sadly delayed, had occurred peaceably across Oklahoma. Now, however, in 1969, a conflict arose on the main stage of the state, and 11 years to the day since Clara Looper and the NAACP Youth Council launched the National Civil Rights Sit-In Movement in the same place, downtown Oklahoma City. The city's 200-plus sanitation workers, garbage men in the parlance of the day, 80% of them black, threatened to walk off their jobs if a slew of demands for pay and working conditions equivalent to those of police and firemen were not met by the city. This dispute had simmered and occasionally boiled over in OKC ever since the 1930s. A who's who of OKC Negro in the common term of the day Negro luminaries stood literally shoulder to shoulder with the sanitation workers in their quest. These included Looper, dentist and community leader Frank Cox, State Senator E. Melvin Porter, State Representatives Hannah Atkins and Archibald Hill, City Councilman Alfonso Dow, and, a name you'll want to remember, St. John's Missionary Baptist Church Pastor W.K. Jackson. City Councilman Dow's lawsuit eight years before had led to the racial integration of Oklahoma City public schools. Well, the Oklahoma City Urban League, as well as OKC's NAACP chapter, its youth council, and state and regional officials also supported the strikers. Having crossed so many social and political barriers during the decade, African-American expectations for further gains were rising as were their frustration and impatience with delays of them. So when weeks-long negotiations broke down, most of the garbage men walked off their jobs on August 19th. Threatening words and actions followed, and the terrifying specter of racial violence on a grand scale appeared. That's right, right here in Oklahoma City. Ominous names hovered like Detroit, Newark, Memphis, Selma, Birmingham, and the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles, cities where racial disputes had spawned tragic bloodshed during the 60s. 
Indeed, Martin Luther King Jr. was murdered in Memphis the year before while dealing with a similar sanitation strike. Emotions, resentment, and fear stoked the impasse. Yet, I'm happy to say restraint and statesmanship appeared from all sides. The strikers, their supporters, and their leaders. That leader was Looper until the resumption of her Northwest class and high school term where she now taught. Then St. John's earlier mentioned Pastor Jackson. These leaders avoided harassment of non-striking workers, replacement workers, and garbage trucks running their routes. Meanwhile, OKC leadership, Mayor James Norick, City Manager Ron Oldman, and, and the City Council had already appointed a Citizens Committee to focus on the issues raised by the strikers. Area lawmen, meanwhile, including commanders and rankers, played a crucial, even historic role in this regard. They exercised a consistent restraint and patience beyond that of their counterparts in the troubled aforementioned cities and others. They did so even when taunted and verbally abused by some strikers and protesters. These brave, cool-headed peacekeepers included the Oklahoma City Police Department, Oklahoma County Sheriff's Department, and the Oklahoma Highway Patrol. In addition, white city leadership met most of the strikers' demands. They granted the majority of the requested salary raise to the sanitation workers and in turn increased salaries of many other city workers. They reduced the work week from six to five days, simplified and improved grievance procedures, and upgraded black employees' job classifications. Some demands, such as back pay for missed days for strikers who returned to work, were not met. The city met the strike crisis with ingenuity and on multiple fronts. 20% of the sanitation force did not strike. Some strikers returned to work. New workers were hired, and volunteers from other city departments pitched in. Accompanied by police patrol cars, they covered an abbreviated schedule of sanitation routes. Fire stations served as pickup points where citizens could take their garbage for disposal. Most OKC black leaders and workers, even if striking or demonstrating, avoided breaking laws. Nearly all the illustrious African American leaders helming this historic strike exhibited not only valor and passion, but humility and great hearted statesmanship. Even though lawmen did arrest several of them for strike and demonstration related offenses. Yet the pressure, danger, and literal stench gradually increased as the strike went on for days, then weeks, then months. Conflict unfolded not only between disenchanted African Americans and city leadership and other whites, but in black ranks as well. The very hot summer of 1969 was about to get even hotter in OKC. It went on for days, weeks, and months. No one picked up the garbage or the trash? Well, a lot of it was picked up. That was We were talking about the efforts to, to pitch in were great, but they still couldn't get it all. In fact, there's a, a really a humorous cartoon in uh, Volume 2 of our Oklahoman series uh, from the Daily Oklahoman of the time that, that shows a man uh, with his trash can overflowing and his wife chewing him out for you know not getting it taken care of. I can hardly wait to hear the golden nugget. This is Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history by the odor in the air. John J. Dwyer. <laughs> This is a moment in Oklahoma history. Well, Gwen, that's why you're so good at what you do. Only you could come up with a lead-in statement like that. Indeed, there was a lot of odor in the air in Oklahoma City as the uh, summer of 1969 stretched and stenched on. Before, <laughs> before the break, we followed the lead-up to the historic 1969 Oklahoma City sanitation workers' strike including how many but not all of the strikers' demands had been met by the time the garbage piled high and political tensions in the city even higher. Also, leaders on all sides, I think in a very difficult cauldron of tension and anger, exhibited statesmanship and patience. Out-of-staters 
in town for the proceedings, on the other hand, struck a different and malignant chord. Phil Savage, a tri-state African-American NAACP director and so-called troubleshooter from Philadelphia, told sanitation workers to get ready to riot. You reach a point when talking is stupid, then we've got to hit the streets, Savage declared. Well, there was no confusion about his words because he'd recently championed a riot in Maryland where several black demonstrators were jailed. If anyone tried to work a sanitation job during the strike, he warned, they will, quote, be taken care of. There's a way the black community can take care of everything, end quote. And if any striker was fired, Phil Savage announced, quote, we'll fix it so garbage trucks will never run in this city. I'm not here to placate anyone. Victory is going to be yours one way or another. There's going to be a lot of people hurt, but you don't get anything without conflict. End quote. Well, according to the Daily Oklahoma newspaper, another black activist, Theodore G.X., moved to OKC from Memphis only a few months before the strike. Pleading poverty, he obtained temporary housing for his family of five in a building that was scheduled to be demolished. Then, however, he refused to leave, claiming police were picking on him. He denied being a black Muslim, but resurfaced a few months later, calling himself the Reverend. Theodore GX. Now leading the Oklahoma City Black Muslim Mosque, he quickly signaled his burgeoning role as an agent of division and bitterness. Learn the white man is your enemy, he declared to a large black crowd as he deemed whites as slave masters. Theodore GX had recruited a lot of young black men who hated white people, remembered the previously mentioned influential OKC African American dentist, Dr. Frank Cox. No one possessed more sterling credentials as a public advocate for constitutional rights for black Oklahomans than Frank Cox, but he perceived GX and his followers as members of the violently radical Black Panthers, anti-U.S. government organization. Cox viewed them as perilous to Oklahoma City in general and the African-American community and its future in particular. Late in the strike, yet another out-of-stater, Roland Betts, Southern Christian Leadership Conference representative from Atlanta, Georgia, announced that mass nighttime marches would go to the homes of city leaders and their families. Disgusted at the low turnout for one such rally, Betts said publicly, I can't understand why we can't get a crowd out to a mass rally like this. I guess the Negroes, and by the way, it's not the N-word that Roland Betts used, Gwen, don't know what's going on, end quote. Well, by the end of October 1969, one irreconcilable issue separated the strikers and their allies who had coalesced around a Citizens Leadership Council, or CLC, and Oklahoma City officials. That issue was the rehiring of 11 fired strike leaders. The CLC, which included many of the aforementioned African-American leaders and others, insisted on the reinstatement of what came to be known to everyone as the Eleven. Here, the city council drew its line in the sand. It agreed to rehire all other striking workers, including leaders and spokesmen. But, said Councilman Ben Franklin, quote, The police know who those 11 are. They've arrested them. The 11 are the ones who have taunted the police, called them bad names, end quote. Rehiring the 11, Franklin asserted, would cost the city the resignations of, quote, a sizable number of the top people in our police department and probably in the fire department, too, end quote. The OKC City Council itself declared, quote, redeployment of these 11 men establishes a precedent that will destroy city government and therefore it will not be done, end quote. And so, Gwen, all the waiting, patience, and forbearance All the negotiations, hopes, fears, and decades of dispute and frustration, particularly by underpaid and under-respected African-American workers, led to the dramatic and unprecedented Black Friday march and demonstrations in the very heart of downtown Oklahoma City on October 31st, 1969. And that's where we'll go next time. Next time, we'll understand why it's called Black Friday. This is Oklahoma Gold.
Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute of History, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwood's Stores, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with our Will Rogers medallion-winning author-historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. It's Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history as this story continues. John J. Dwyer, Oklahoma City's Black Friday. Why is it called Black Friday? Well, the main reason, from what I can tell in reading the historic accounts, and this was a term that was commonly applied to it in the uh, media of the day, was that there was a sense of dread that was hanging over that day as it approached because people on all sides knew that for months tensions had been building in the city, in Oklahoma City, over the uh, sanitation workers' strike. You know, it had come to a basically a climactic stage at which there was going to be a march by thousands of people on downtown Oklahoma City. So it was the march that was called Black Friday. Yes, and the concern that events might spiral out of control around it. And it was all about a sanitation strike. That's correct. And we talked about that last time. And those that haven't heard the previous one, uh, I would encourage you to go back to part one of Black Friday, the Oklahoma City sanitation strike. You can hear anytime at johnjdwyer.com. And it was the uh, leading up to one of the most dramatic showdowns in Oklahoma history, the famed Black Friday sanitation strike march on downtown Oklahoma City. And this added to the drama on Halloween Day, 1969. Now, despite when many belated civil rights gains for blacks through the 1960s, the city's 200-plus sanitation workers, 80% of them black, had threatened to walk off their jobs if a slew of demands for pay and working conditions equal to those of police and firemen were not met by the city. Though most of the demands were eventually met, and the white leaders of the city and the black leaders of the African-American community had exhibited heroic statesmanship and patience in this tense drama, most of the city's garbage men, as they were then called, had indeed gone on strike late in the summer of 1969 for a period that stretched into months. As garbage piles, tempers, and out-of-state agitation all mounted, word spread of the October 31st march. OKC Mayor James Norick had declared a state of emergency around City Hall and other municipal buildings. This prohibited groups of three or more from congregating. Dr. Frank Cox, meanwhile, had developed a dim view of the inflammatory influence he observed the charismatic black Muslim Theodore G. X. exerting over the city's African-American young people. Frank Cox, as some who are listening no doubt remember, was a giant of Oklahoma history, Gwen, civil rights champion, Oklahoma City Urban League president, dentist, entrepreneur, president of the Medifar African American Medical Professionals Association, trailblazer in everything from OKC golf courses to the Catholic Church to cable TV. Well, in Dr. Cox's words, and he told me this in a 2008 interview we had at his house, Theodore GX was a very intelligent, threatening sort of guy. You didn't mess with Theodore. He offered the protection of the Black Panthers for the marchers on Black Friday. I wanted to make sure that he understood I was holding him responsible, Dr. Cox ended that quote. Well, the Black Panthers were a violent Oakland, California-based black supremacist organization ostensibly formed in 1966 to protect African-American communities from police brutality. They, the Panthers, were pretty radical. They attacked white businesses in Oklahoma City. And again, these were the words of civil rights leader and business entrepreneur Dr. Frank Cox. He added, if a white couple drove through the black neighborhoods, they would attack the car, smash the windows. They killed a white couple, end quote, Dr. Cox talking about the Black Panthers. Cox asked Theodore GX to come to his office a few days before Black Friday. I hear you'd like to do some recruiting in the black community, he told GX, but I want you to understand something. This is my town. 
We're not going to let you take over our town. We're not going to let you tear it up. He said this in reference to other American cities recently stricken by racial violence. We have a peaceful community, and we'd like it to stay that way, Dr. Cox said. Well, in that memorable conversation that I had 40 years later, Gwen, spending the afternoon with Dr. Cox, told me, quote, Many of the black youth in Oklahoma City were under the control of Theodore GX. He had recruited a lot of young black men who hated white people. I said to him, you've got to keep those people under control because we don't want any shooting. I know those cops. They're going to be armed. If anything happens, somebody's going to get hurt. I don't want my people shot, and I don't want them harassed, end quote. There's a window into Oklahoma history for you, isn't it, that I bet none of us have heard. Well, amidst the scene fraught with tension of a magnitude never before witnessed in Oklahoma City, a mass demonstration of around 1,500 people, most dressed in all black. So maybe there's another indicator of why the day was referred to as Black Friday. They moved from Washington Boulevard in Far East Oklahoma City to the downtown City Hall. A significant number of whites participated in the march as did many hundreds of young blacks, primarily from all-black Douglas High School. So did the Reverend Theodore GX and scores of young African Americans, some representing the fearsome Black Panthers, some the Black Muslims. Entering downtown, the students began chanting, Black Power, Black Power, in unison, and raising their fists in the Black Power sign of the era. High school history teacher Clara Looper, legendary mother of the Civil Rights Movement and subject of other Oklahoma Gold episodes, hurried back from her position at the front of the march and silenced them. Then OKC Police Chief Wayne Lawson and Oklahoma County Sheriff Bob Taylor confronted the marchers. They asked who was their leader, St. John's Missionary Baptist Church Pastor W.K. Jackson, who now has a Northeast Oklahoma City freeway named for him, stepped forward and said, the Lord is our leader, and the Holy Spirit is guiding us. Chief Lawson and Sheriff Taylor then allowed the marchers to proceed and convene at the east steps of City Hall. Several hundred helmeted police and state troopers, dressed in riot gear and armed with shotguns, pistols, and long truncheons, masked behind and partially around them. We have a picture of this in Volume 2 of the Oklahomans from the Daily Oklahoman newspaper of the day. Many of these lawmen had witnessed and in some cases been ordered to tolerate disrespectful, even unlawful behavior from strikers and their supporters, including some in OKC leadership circles. The entire Black Friday enterprise, once it entered downtown environs, was illegal. Through it all, and especially now as they observe the largest crowd of protesting demonstrators ever to descend upon the capital of the state, the lawmen had feared destructive and even violent behavior toward property, the general public, themselves, and the protesters. For this was an era of the 1960s in which many destructive and deadly racial riots had erupted in big cities across America. But the thin blue line had steadfastly maintained their composure in Oklahoma City and their professionalism regardless of pressure, provocation, or danger. Now, though, came the greatest danger yet in the heart of downtown Oklahoma City. The stench, the dread, the dress. I can hardly wait for the golden nugget. This is Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history when we hear of the actual day, the actual event, Black Friday in Oklahoma City, what happened, John J. Dwyer? Well, Gwen, before the break, we described how 1,500 Oklahoma City sanitation strike demonstrators, men, women, and young people, mostly black but numerous whites, had converged on City Hall in downtown Oklahoma City. Halloween Day, 1969, hundreds of armed lawmen flanked the assembly. Meanwhile, beloved St. John's Missionary Baptist Church pastor W.K. Jackson mounted the steps of Oklahoma City City Hall. He took a megaphone offered to him by white OKC Police Chief Wayne Lawson, and Jackson asked everyone to sit down. 
This shrewd act provided the marchers a rest. It removed the immediate threat of nose-to-nose conflict with the nearby lawmen and subtly lent a valuable air of friendly convocation rather than physical confrontation to a setting of transcendent drama. Pastor Jackson then offered an eloquent prayer in his deep, smooth, baritone voice. He reiterated his support for the sanitation workers and their requests, reminded the assembled hosts to be orderly and peaceful, and mentioned a meeting that evening for strike supporters. He asked, quote, that each and every one of us peacefully now disperse on the sidewalks, not the streets, in groups of not more than three, end quote. Well, similar scenes of conflict and even far lesser ones had so often erupted into tumult and bloodshed around America in the 60s. But I'm happy to say that Black Friday endures as a testimony of Christian and Oklahoma chivalry on all sides. Oh, and remember Dr. Frank Cox's warning to black Muslim minister Theodore G.X. prior to Black Friday? Well, G.X. had promised to convey Cox's message to his people. And according to one city leader... Despite the intense drama of the day, no violence nor even any significant provocations occurred. There wasn't so much as a bloody nose, Dr. Frank Cox remembered. Sadly, though, a single issue soon erupted, whether the city would rehire the 11, those defiant sanitation strike leaders who had caused Oklahoma City police all sorts of problems. A front-page Daily Oklahoman editorial wrote, quote, Oklahoma City is in imminent danger. It is sitting on a time bomb with perhaps a 48-hour fuse. So the drama wasn't over with Black Friday, Gwen. The Oklahoma editorial continued, If the bomb explodes, it will seriously affect the next 20 years of Oklahoma City history. The black community and the white community have been at sword's point for many weeks. End quote. Well, the strikers vowed more frequent demonstrations. The Black Panther faction loomed sullen, seething, dangerous. 200 Southside Capitol Hill white businessmen, fed up with the strike and the strikers, announced they would man garbage trucks to aid those already doing so in order that full routes could resume in spite of the strike for as long as it lasted. So as this witch's brew of discord boiled to the brim, Oklahoma City oil man and civic and business leader Stanton Young stepped up. Breaking off a vacation, he returned to the city and huddled privately with Reverend W.K. Jackson. When the two emerged, the pastor proceeded to gain both the Elevens and their supporters, including that influential Citizens Leadership Council, all of their backing for an audacious plan. The Eleven had previously refused to help end the strike by accepting private sector jobs that Young intended to find for them, Stanton Young. Now, with the help of OKC business leaders, Stanton Young had secured specific jobs for the men in the private sector, and he gained Pastor Jackson's support for the plan, which would also provide for the unemployed and heretofore blacklisted men's families and end the strike. The Daily Oklahoman blazed the thick black headline, Happy Friday, Strike Settled. It echoed Pastor Jackson's declaration that Happy Friday would replace another imminent Black Friday. It was a triumphant day for nearly the whole city and, by extension, the state. The strikers and their supporters, including Dr. Frank Cox, Clara Looper, Reverend W.K. Jackson, and the rest of the black community's Citizens Leadership Council, won most of what they asked for, and they, for the most part, honored and followed the forbearing, nonviolent Christian legacy of the beloved Martin Luther King, Jr., Lawmen had maintained their composure and professionalism amidst withering pressure. They, along with both the African-American community and the majority white community, had refrained from venting their anger and frustration through violence. And Gwen, perhaps black city councilman and OKC school integration trailblazer Alfonso Dow, who was still, by the way, facing a hearing for a felony charge of rioting, provided perhaps the best benediction for this remarkable drama We have not been in confrontation, Dow said. White against black. More white people have benefited from the upgraded city pay and benefits than black. There has been more praying and reading of scriptures than ever before in Oklahoma City. Black Friday to Happy Friday. Now that's Oklahoma Gold. Gold.